Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 455, one of many of the scripted episodes this week. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 31st of October, which is All Hallows' Eve. Okay, Gavin, looks like you're dressed up as a bishop for Halloween. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> you are yes, certainly so dressed not. up to be warm. I, you don't have the heater on out at the uh, the, the chapel. Oh, I, I do. No, no. I, I've I've got a I've got a small electric radiator burning away beside me. It's been the, <laughs> it's 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 uh, we're down to zero in, in the temperature at the moment. So okay, it, it's it's quite chilly. We we had the same temperature last night for the first time this uh, fall. The furnace kicked on. And uh, I think this is our record. Last year was like uh, October 21st. And it just shows how uh, greedy I am and, and minded about how much money I spend on the furnace that I know exactly the day and time the furnace went off. Uh, well, it's, actually, it's Kevin, it's not, I, I don't think it's greed at all. Uh, last, last winter was the first winter we spent here. I was very cold as well as having four operations. And yes. uh, I... I, I the, the expense of keeping yourself warm at night is quite considerable. And for people on a tight budget, actually heating is is, is a very significant factor. So um, I think it's good stewardship as, as well as being concerned about ecology. Um, mm. But I don't think we should be embarrassed about good stewardship of our resources. And it, it doesn't help to be cold either if we can avoid it. Let's move on to story number one. Story number <laughs> one is written down here is we're going to like share comment subscribe and we have a podcast now if you, before you even watch the show i recommend you like it uh because your attitude may change by the time you get to the back of of the show please share it with your friends i see more and more people sharing it and that's very encouraging um and a lot more youtube comments i don't know if you've uh, been watching these but uh, each show is garnering you know almost 20 comments and that's pretty impressive for uh a a show about Anglicanism. Uh, if you're not getting immediate updates when we publish a new show, like this week, I think we had three shows, um, you want to subscribe uh, on YouTube. You click the little red button. And if you are a millennial and you like podcasts, you will find that we have a podcast. Just go to the YouTube station and you click on the uh, show notes. And in each show, there's the link to the podcast. It's not just about being millennial, Kevin. I think you and I have, have faces for radio. Yes, that's right. <laughs> no question about it. I mean, I got stubble coming back on the top of the head today. I need to go uh, shave before my trip tomorrow. Um, let's talk about, and I don't know what's gotten into you guys over in England, but it seems the bishop and clergy in England are on this letter writing campaign. Uh, over the last uh, two weeks, we've had two letters, and today we get a third uh, from the Diocese of Oxford. And it's a pastoral letter on homosexuality. And uh, the continued Indaba conversation on that topic. And I thought you and I could talk about it because it's in English, but it's called English Ease. It's your type of English, and <laughs> we need to uh, discuss it. But it's a much shorter letter than we're used to from uh, the other, compared to the other two. So well, that, that's not much of a comparison. The other two were, were used as so many words to say not very much. But yeah. this this one is much more concise. It's true, um, but it's still uh, it feels to me coming like a, like a, like we're in a, a chess match, and um, you know one side makes a move, uh, and, and it's it's a certain kind of opening. Um, this is the this is the pity me universalist opening. <laughs> <laughs> yes. and and uh, it's it's a it's a famous move it's been used quite often in this chess match for the last 30 years and it's no more convincing to biblical christianity now than it was when it's first tried it's it starts off by the bishops in the diocese of oxford saying um, we have received many requests for guidance you know i it's not that i don't believe them kevin but the Church of England is, is not and never has been full of clergy or laity writing to their bishops saying, help, help, oh, give no. us moral guidance. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so I, I don't believe them. I, I think that what the guidance really is about is how can we win this battle? Um, that's, that is the key here because 
Uh, as far as Lambeth, uh, a, a deciding body within the Anglican Church communion, um, this is a decided issue. Uh, they talked about it uh, back in Lambeth 1920. They have uh, uh, talked about it in Lambeth 1998. Uh, they have direct statements on sexuality, marriage, and the role of humans within those two contexts. And so it's not like you can wake up one day being in the staff of the, for the Bishop of Oxford and say, we can change those things. I was very interested in your conversation <clears throat> with, with Dr. Lee Gatiss yesterday. I thought it was a very good conversation. And I was glad to hear what Lee says. Lee's a very clear-minded thinker, uh, and he leads a very important constituency of the Church of England. Lee said there are circumstances in which we would withdraw from the Church of England, and if we did, we would ruin it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the trouble is the circumstances aren't clear. And so what we have is we have two sides committed to a lack of clarity. Uh, the evangelical constituency doesn't really want it to be clear in case, well, just in case they really do have to act. That would be very inconvenient. <laughs> they're, men, they're men and women of great principle. They love the scriptures. Um, but if the progressive authorities would give them some wiggle room, they'd be glad for it. And at the same time, the progressive authorities don't want to cast, throw down a, a very serious challenge, just in case it's too rigid and taking it up. So this letter here, follows the same gambit we've had all the time, which is, first of all, to begin on a series of false theological assumptions, uh, and then to say, on, on the one hand, this, but on the other hand, the other. Uh, and as such, well, do you know, I'm afraid I feel it's disingenuous. Uh, I don't, I don't think it's about, I don't think it, it's not, it's not helping people towards the truth or the reality. And using English ease is another way of of, of achieving that I'm afraid but that's just part of it. can't help that <laughs> it's interesting because when I read something written by American written by the English written by uh, somebody in Africa uh, sometimes I wonder did they just try to conjure up what Joe Olstein would say before they put pen to paper um, and I well, get I get that from this I, I Joe Olstein could have written this letter because well, he wants yeah, to it, ride that middle line of what tradition, experience, reason, and scripture say, and what the church really wants. Now, the Church of England, as far as I'm concerned, really wants to fully adopt LGBTB, whatever the acronym is today, um, access to all parts of the church, blessings, weddings, um, uh, just the full contents of acceptance where it doesn't pass the science test it doesn't pass the anthropology test it doesn't pass the scripture test the tradition test uh, every every time it's been tried uh, by the church in, in its doctrine it doesn't pass the test but that doesn't stop the desire of the church of england if we keep trying long enough somebody's going to stop talking from the other side and we will win it reminds me, Kevin, of, of, of a bit of like the First World War or, or nationalism in the 1900s. In the 1900s and a bit before, the real problem in European society was the, um, the, the colonial ambitions of nationalist states. And one of the things that Christianity ought to have been able to do was to say, um, as actually dear old uh, Archbishop Runcie did at the service for the Falklands that, that made uh, Margaret Thatcher so cross. We should be able to say there are Christians in all different nations and the nation state is not our God. Uh, we owe a certain allegiance to it, but not much. And But actually the Church of England amongst many other national churches gave itself entirely to the, to the nation state, the kind of zeitgeist of the time. We have a different zeitgeist now it, and it's to do, it's, it's partly created by Freud and the pill. It's Freud who played such a significant part in telling us our identity was constructed out of our sexual desires and our uh, sexual narrative. And the pill said, hey, you can do what you like without really suffering too many consequences. Um, and this has changed the zeitgeist into a kind of romantic, sexualized anthropology that has nothing to do with scripture or Christian anthropology or tradition, but is so much in our faces as part of our present culture that 
Christians have been secularized by it. Now, one of the things that church ought to be saying today is, how do we redeem the culture? Yeah. Uh, because the culture so badly needs redeeming. Having a, having your main identity as your sexuality or your sexual or romantic longings is 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 not a good way forward. <laughs> and it's it's fraught with danger, and it, and and of course it's so it's so impoverished. So my problem with this letter is. It doesn't ask any serious theological questions. It doesn't uh, affirm any biblical principles. It just runs straight in and say, here's how we're going to try and win this battle for the zeitgeist. It starts off by saying uh, the archbishops called for a radical new inclusion. People are made in the image of God, so there is no problem. That's not what Jesus said in the Gospels. Jesus said something very different. Uh, and the early theologians make this great distinction between the image and the likeness of God. Yes, we're all God's children in his image. But until the Holy Spirit gets his hand on us, we don't have much of his likeness. Now, you you pressed Lee yesterday saying, look, it's all about repentance, isn't it, Lee? And, and Lee had slightly other fish to fry. Uh, of course, he does agree with you. I know he agrees with you. Um, but he can't agree with you too much because otherwise uh, it becomes crystal clear biblical christians are saying to zeitgeist christians hey we have to repent and and as we try to repent so we can invite the rest of the culture to repent that's not the basis this letter is written on now I, you're a bishop you can correct me if i'm wrong the entirety of the new testament is about our identity in christ absolutely <laughs> <laughs> just, it's an old it just, <laughs> It's what St. Paul spends so much time writing about. There's so much better effect than some other letter writers. Okay, yes. Paul, behold, anyone in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone. The old being your old longing. But you see, there's nothing of that here. What it, what it says here is that um, to, to, to be a human being, you have to bring your loves to the table. And then you get your loves blessed. But, but you know, Jesus, Jesus never. We, I think you were saying earlier before the show that actually in the lists in in Scripture, which include uh, deviant sexuality, um, they're all about having distorted appetites, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know whether whether it's stealing uh, or lying or greed, greed. Uh, or misexpressed sexuality, um, the gospel touches them all and takes something crooked and self-indulgent because they're all self-indulgent, and then puts it straight. There's nothing in this letter, there's nothing in the Church of England's attempt to impose the zeitgeist that carries any of that transformative challenge or opportunity to Christians. Well, I would enter a conversation in Indaba on changing the anthropology of greed. Now, I certainly am a self-employed business person, uh, have done very well by the world's standards, but I could do so much more <laughs> if we could change how the church and history and science and, and anthropology feels about greed. And I'm willing to, to entertain that, but nobody will hear me, uh, Gavin, nobody. Well, and yet this, this emphasis on romance and sex is, is about greed and need. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about wanting more of something that you like, but it's about needing something that isn't in the spirit, it's in the flesh, it's in the human nature. The, the letter goes on to say, um, everyone's made in the image of God, so, so you know, there is no, no, no repentance. It, it just is not there. And then it says, by the way, um, whilst this work is going on, the work of the pastoral committee that's going to lead to uh, uh, live love and faith, I keep on wanting to give it a different name, but never mind. That's pure out of me. Um, the, 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 everything is changing in society. But if everything is changing in society, the task is not to go with the change, but to challenge the change or to redeem the change or to guide the change. But as far as this letter is concerned, we go with the change. And then it says LGBTI plus. You, you wonder how many letters they're going to put on of the, of the alphabet soup. But we're, we're LGBTI plus plus at the moment always been actively involved in the clergy and church lives but now they want to be openly and authentically themselves well that's a euphemism that means we get to live with whoever we want to get to live with without criticism it's nothing mm -hmm. about being openly and authentically ourselves and if it was to be openly and authentically a christian is is to shrive yourself 
of of everything that that isn't it isn't offered to us in the gospels and in the gospels the relationships we have are celibacy or marriage that's being authentically christian yeah. um it then goes on to say and this this is this is lamentable there is a there is within the homosexual culture a great deal of self-pity uh, I, I don't know why it's there. I, I, I think actually this is part of a, a, a spiritual colouring that actually comes from stepping off the main Christian highway. But whatever the reason is, there's a spirit of self-pity about it, and it's used to justify special status. And so once again, they say uh, a lot of people uh, have had pain in their sexuality, and we have failed them. That's Kevin. That's just not true. Um, we, we've all failed each other in a whole variety of ways. I failed you. You, I, we, I don't know. You failed me, but you. Oh might no! Have done I, that. Yeah, I, mean, I guarantee it. We, <laughs> we failed each other. Take it to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> it to the bank. But, but, but there is no special pronounced failure due for, to, to people for their sexuality. Um, most of the failure that I think I see in the church is actually with people being being proud and dismissive of one another. The te terrible cultures of club, excluding people who don't belong to your club, but it's, but it's hardly ever the sexuality club. There are far more clubs than that. And then they go on, and I hope you'll take this up, they go on to say that, that the LGBT people have been bullied far too long and at that point well go on you, you take well, it well <laughs> i want to back up a second we talked about the the spiritual um oppression that i've seen in in my friends who suffer from uh, homosexual and same sex sex attractions um there is shame they they will my friends will tell me they feel a shame for whether they feel they were created that way, whether they feel you know it was a nature nurture thing, but there is a spiritual shame in how they feel, and that's why they call their movement the Pride Movement. And yes, it's, you know, an it's, it's, to, it's, it's to overcome yes. th that innate, and I'm going to call it a spiritual feeling um, that they feel shame. And I I fully recognize and acknowledge that they feel shame. And uh, the the church may be failing in how to address that shame, uh, because what we want to do is encourage the shame. Uh, it seems, and uh, I'm talking about the Church of England, and people who are trying oh, yeah. to to change the the, uh, the the teaching of the church. Bullying has changed in the last ten years. Yes, in the 1940s and 50s, um, the seculars and the Christians would bully. Uh, those who were different than them, including the homosexual, gay, lesbian community, it was atrocious, the sins within and without the church. There was a lot of bullying going around. In the last 10 years, the, 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 the shoe is on the other foot. I think that's what they say. Balls on the foot. Whatever they say. Uh, it's changed. Now the Christians, uh, the evangelicals, those who think um, that there is a line in the sand where which... Um, you do not want to bless same-sex relationships, they're being bullied. So if you do not agree with the zeitgeist, if you do not agree with the, the culture, you are being bullied. And we saw this many times in England where um, people were brought up in the courts uh, for not baking the right cake, for not uh, preaching the right preach, for not agreeing to give uh, the right wedding. And the Church of England witnessed the bullying and said nothing. So I, I, I find this very disingenuous, disingenuous, disingenuous from <laughs> the Church of England, the Diocese of Oxford, because bullying is it, it's completely off the topic now. It was 10 years ago, but it, it's changed. So I, I, I agree with that entirely. Um, I, I, I'd like to give more thought to the shame thing, but probably not here sure. and now. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, you know, there's a straight version of shame, which is which which most all straight men feel with their wand with our wandering eyes. Um, mm -hmm. We too know shame. I'm not in a position to know whether or not straight people feel more or less shame than gay people. I think these are generalizations that one one can't easily make. But I do think your point about bullying is absolutely essential. 
I I have in 40 years in the Church of England, I have never witnessed any bullying of someone for their sexuality. Um, that doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but it's a very problematic platform the Lord to campaign like this on and to say there is wholesale bullying and, and this has to change. When, as you quite rightly say, all the bullying for the last 10, 20 years has actually been of conservative traditionalists uh, being held to account for their beliefs by a by the secular zeitgeist. In this letter, the, the bishops go on to talk, they say, talking about sexuality and gender identity is difficult and involves our deeply personal loves and the attachments that shape them. But we don't have any free pass to deeply personal loves and attachments. All we have is a commitment to try and make our loves and our attachments consistent with what God wants them to be. Now, that's an enormous struggle. Um, you know, we, we, it's part of the great depth of spiritual teaching within Christianity that our loves and our attachments are a real problem. And we have to put most of them to death. Um, and yet I'm there's gonna, no... <laughs> I'm going to show you a great love in my life. The, sorry for the podcast uh, listeners. Okay. But I am encouraged by this letter because this is my great love. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you want to read this from the context of a person who's, you know, looking for a change in the anthropology of many different sins of the Bible, I'm encouraged. Our loves and attachments do not get a free pass just because we feel a lot of love and a lot of attachment. They have to be held up to what the scriptures teach us and what the church has always understood the spiritual task to be. And it is constantly wrestling with our lower selves, with our lower attachments, in order to be set free from them. Um, and then, then uh, um, one of the giveaways in this letter is the point where the, the bishops come out with their new epistemology. They say that, that this is, and this I do find this frustrating and annoying. It's on the one hand this, but on the, but actually we mean something else. So they say, it is important that these debates should be grounded in scripture, reason, and tradition, as well as deep prayer and our common life of worship. Oh, I do wish they meant that, because they then because if they meant that, that's all, you'd, that's all you'd have to say. But then here's their disclaimer: they must also. <laughs> be conducted with attention to people's experiences and in, a, and, and in a spirit of love, mutual care and respect. But actually, this is disingenuous. We don't, we do not bring our experiences to scripture and then say scripture has to fit in with my experience. Um, this is a form of uh, epist epistemology of existentialism and, right. and it's, it's sub-Christian, it's, it's wrong, it's untrue. Uh, and and they, they should know it's untrue. No, uh, this letter uh, and its failure is, you know, it's exactly what the problem is 101. Uh, you can see everything that's wrong with the church in this letter because for all intensive purposes, the, the doctrine of sexuality is a decided doctrine for 2,000 years. Uh, it's unchangeable. The tradition of sexuality doctrine and sexuality in scripture, the tradition of the church, unchangeable uh, for 2,000 years. Uh, reason. Well, well 3,000 three, 3, years actually, Kevin. I would, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> we go back. Add the 1,000 years of purity teaching that the first yes. covenant <laughs> set down as a template because that's where the roots of it are. <laughs> Very good correction. Thank you. And, and the same with reason. Uh, reason uh, goes all the way back, and those three things are unchangeable. So what are you going to change? What? Well, it, what, this is what they're trying to change. Mm -hmm. uh, they say, so the House of Bishops acknowledge that sa some same-sex couples will continue to seek recognition of their new situation in the context of an act of worship. Uh, and then they say, then they do their double act. But as bishops, we are not allowed to authorize public liturgy. But here's what you can do, guys. Here's how you can get around all this. Um, we uh, we are looking for ways of offering positive encouragement for clergy to respond pastorally and sensitively. That's the end game of the chess match. 
we know there won't be any change to canon law and a doctrine but what there will be is uh, in the middle of a change of climate there will be opportunities uh, and uh, affirmations of people to respond whatever pastorally and sensitivity means um, in in the end perhaps it um, there won't be a red line because because what we're simply doing is we're, we're dragging the corpse of the church further and further to the edge of the ravine <laughs> until until one day it it fall it falls over but in the meantime um would it, it's just the recreation of christianity in the image of the zeitgeist celebrating romance and sex uh and and putting on the back burner the invitation to crucify yourself in order to inhabit the Holy Spirit. And at what point can you say this has gone too far? Well, you know, Lee Gatiss and, and um, his highly esteemed colleagues think they have some way to go before they need to disassociate themselves. But the whole venture of this is to allow this change of 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 spirituality and identity to take place without forcing anyone to jump ship mm -hmm. in the end it will be the people of, of of tender conscience i think who jump ship and and the rest well we know what this kind of church produces it produces tech um and and tech doesn't replicate itself in the name of the gospel it's dying out it will be it'll be a shame to see the church of england die out simply to allow people to indulge their loves and their attachments dragging the corpse of the church what a go for a halloween theme i like that that was <laughs> awesome sorry Kevin. <laughs> all right let's talk about some good news <laughs> uh i don't know and i have not followed the story the only part i saw somebody was released uh or found innocent in pakistan of blasphemy and Boom, BBC picks it up, AP picks it up. I said, well, I better look at the story. Apparently some lady um, who is a Christian in Pakistan. It should be. Oh, God, I pray for this lady because uh, you want to talk about bullying. You want to talk about the whole culture is against you. It's being a Christian in Pakistan. Uh, Asia, uh, what's her first name again? Asia, Asia Bibi. That's what I have written down. I, I want to be sure I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, was oh, I don't know I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, just, it's not going to happen. Um, was accused of blasphemy because she gave a co-worker who is Muslim water. She being a Christian is uh, unclean. And uh, that is a blasphemy in, in, according to the deep Sharia laws held in Pakistan. And she went to trial. And thank gosh for some uh, principled politics at the international level said you don't want to do this and she has been uh i set free and found innocent for now she's been eight years in solitary confinement the poor love mm. for giving for giving water to her neighbor and and in the same week that she has been released thank god um the european court of human rights has has attempted to um, bring in the very same law of blasphemy into European legal culture that was used in a, obviously a much more intense way to, to, to lock her up. Um, I just don't think we know what we're dealing with when it comes to these dynamics. The other, the other dreadful thing, and we have to pray for this woman enthusiastically. Um, people have been praying for her, and thank God her prayers have been answered affirmatively, and she's been released. But 145 Muslim clerics immediately pronounced a fatwa on her uh, with a reward of several hundred thousand dollars for killing her because she's been accused of blasphemy and as far as they're concerned that's enough. So we live in a very dangerous world and uh, this this wonderful woman uh, on, on the eve of All Saints Day acts I think as an example of, of holiness and self-sacrifice and courage for Jesus that ought to inspire the rest of us to get our priorities right. Mm, indeed. Uh, in fact, if you don't know what a fatwa is, I suggest you Google the name Salman Rushdie and uh, you uh, will get caught up on exactly what that means to her uh, because it changed his life uh, 
drastically. Well, I was surprised to see that when I, when I began to do some research for an article I recently written for a newspaper, uh, that it was the Rushdie fatwas that led to the hate crime uh, mm. being brought into uh, as 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 a as a malformed response. But like like so many things, they have a life of themselves and they've caused damage. But anyway, yes, that's a fatwa. Fatwa is a judicial, uh, an Islamic judicial uh, judgment that. that offers serious consequences against the person it's, it's issued against. Mm. Okay, well, we have had our Halloween show. <laughs> I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashend, and you've been listening to episode 455 of Anglican Unscripted. Happy All Saints Day tomorrow. <laughs>